what is even worse is some of them leave the church yes. altogether. Yes. I don't know if that is happening, but I, 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 have, yes. I have seen it, you know, in our parishes. That is the reason why being affirmative also means that we, we try to be very prudent with the words that we use in our actions so that we can uh, strengthen their commitment rather than shoot them away. This is what I mean by a sample strategic plan. You can talk about key directions or thrusts that you have for the year. And I suggest don't put too many. Because if you put too many here, okay, your energies will be dissipated. They will go in different directions. You know, perhaps you want to raise the level of commitment. That's one. You want to get more catechists. That's another one. You want to have uh, better uh, and deeper ongoing formation or in-service training. Three of them. Perhaps that's enough for one year. <coughs> Work on them. That's enough. Don't put too many. Then for another year, then get another one. Or you maintain another one, but bring it to another level. So these are what we call the key directions or thrusts. Then strategies. The strategies are how will you do it? For example, if you say, uh, we want more catechists, what strategies do you have in order to have more catechists? It is not enough to just write it on the board. You know, you have to do something that is doable. For example, have you tried talking at the end of the Mass, for example? Have you tried talking about the apostolate of, of uh, catechesis? That is what? That is a strategy. Just as recruiting, uh, recruitment, vocation recruitment is now necessary. Before they said, no, oh, there is no need People see us and they will be attracted. You know, in today's generation, that is not enough. That is not enough. Perhaps you might want to use social media, you know, as part of your strategies. Then your activities, what will you do? The strategies are the how, the activities are the concrete things that you need to do in order to achieve the strategies. Then the time frame. You are talking here about one year, two years, then you can put here the different, uh, how many months, okay, how many days, etc. Then person responsible and person accountable. The person responsible is the one who will do the action. The person accountable is usually somebody higher than that person is accountable. In your case, I suppose, most of you, if not all of you, are persons accountable. The persons responsible are your catechists. Correct? Now, there might be some actions where you are both responsible and accountable. Why? Because you lack personnel. But if you have the personnel, the person responsible should be different from the person accountable. You are accountable to the pastor. You are accountable to the bishop. So the one responsible is the one who will do the immediate action. You are the one supervising. You are overseeing. If that is the way, I understand your role. Okay. Next one is the budget. Now, nobody wants to talk about the budget. In my experience, you know. But this is where you have to put really uh, some amount. And sometimes, even if it is difficult, you know, I encourage you to talk to your pastors. Because this is one area that very often doesn't get a lot of funding. 
and yet it is very necessary if we have to pass on the faith. Some of the pandi perhaps, you know, uh, may not be as important as pandi, catechesis, and Catholic education. Because, as St. Paul says, you know, we have to pass on the faith. If we don't speak, they will not listen. And if we don't speak, the word of God will not be spread. That is the reason why we do catechesis. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, any questions? Any questions? Any concerns? Yes. Can you? Yes. You can do that. Uh, I have done it in uh, in uh, Adamson before. You know, I have done it that way. That is also possible. But but uh, basically, we would like them to talk to one another and share their stories. You know, as uh, Dr. Cooper Ryder said, uh, quoting the Romanian proverb. Uh, stories have wings, they fly from one mountain to another, you know? So through these stories, we generate a lot. We are actually changing, in a way, the negative culture within an organization and making it positive. And here, stories are very important. So go to that written thing as a last recourse. As a last recourse. But if you can, or if, they write them down, and you have a chance to visit them, to to have a small group discussion with them, group sharing. Do that. I would, I would encourage you to do it. But if there is no other recourse in order to get data from them, you can do it by uh, them writing down. Okay. Yes, Father. Uh, a very hopeful methodology. That is the reason why uh, sometimes when I talk to people, I said, if this has been proven very useful in businesses to bring up their business, what more in the church? We have to be Easter people. We, we have to be hopeful. You know? And all around us are signs of negativity. There is always uh, a negative culture. We have a lot of challenges to face. But we cannot stop and say and get paralyzed because there are a lot of things that are against us. The more we should be challenged to look for solutions, to look for better ways of doing things rather than lose hope. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Oh, the key direction there is also the trust. The trust. The trust of the year what you want to work on, the, the more general theme that you want to work on. And as I said, just choose two, three, or five, maximum of five. Don't uh, waste your energy in so many things. Anyway, you are there for a long haul. You will not yet die next year, <laughs> you know. Like one of our priests, we told him, Father, you give so many so long, homilies, these people will not die next year. <laughs> they will still keep on listening to you. And he told us, well, you know, God is infinite. <laughs> so, natalo kami sa argument. <laughs> yes. Father, uh, Father the, the concern is this. I noticed that in our sharings, we, 
there were really good sharings. However, in terms of a strategic plan, uh, uh, how do we know that it is the, 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 the action that we are about to take? Kasi parang, parang in the process, medyo vague pa yung mga answers, mga ano. So, how do we, how do we know that this is it? This is the one that we are going to do for the next five years? How, how do we concretize? Okay, very good Thank question. You. you know, the questionnaire that I gave you is only for the first phase. It is only to discover the strengths, to discover the aspirations, the dreams that you want for your organization. After you discover the themes, what is coming out, you know, many times, what is recurring, then the next time is you dialogue. And you ask yourselves, are these really the themes that we want to develop? For example, talking about commitment. Or they might say, well, we're already committed. No need to strengthen that. You know, perhaps the more you, sh you should strengthen it. But then you have to dialogue about this strengths. Don't take them for granted. Just dialogue about them. Then you choose which among these you would like to work on. Now, we cannot give you a black and white answer. This is where, this is where the constructionist approach of appreciative inquiry comes in. You are the ones to construct your own organization. In appreciative inquiry, they will not tell you whether your organization is the best or not. <coughs> the persons within the organization will be the ones to determine. So you will shape and hold your organization according to what you want it to be. So in one diocese, perhaps they will work on the number of catechists. In another, it could be on their ongoing formation. In another, it could be in terms of remuneration. So it depends on every diocese. It depends on every situation. Sister. I'm just thinking of something that if you have already that one, the, the one that you have given us, the plan itself. Yes. I'm thinking of the monitoring within the year. So okay. do we have um, para evaluation or partial so we can regularly, I don't know, monitor if this is really rather than at the end or mid-year at the end? Is there something quantitative, qualitative or measure? You know, uh, actually, if you go to the handbook, and by the way, if you go to the website, or you go to the internet, you just type the word appreciative inquiry, and you will find thousands of references, you know, uh, how they use it, you know, different methods. You might want to say to type appreciative inquiry evaluation, and and you you can have there some ways to evaluate. Again, in evaluation, we look at what is positive, what is happening. Yes, you maintain the spirit of uh, appreciative inquiry. Okay, does that mean to say that you cannot ask negative questions? You can ask negative questions. Why is this not happening? You know, where are we failing? You know, but they are all towards a particular positive answer. So that what we want to do in appreciative inquiry is how can we use what is positive in order to serve, to solve what is negative? Why is it we say, uh, you learn from your experience? But when you say that phrase, you learn from your experience, what you are saying is the negative experience. Sana matuto ka dyan, kasi nagdapa ka dyan. Bakit hindi natin sabi, sana matuto ka dyan, kasi naging successful ka dyan? No? Look at it from another perspective. Why can't we learn from our success? Why do we always learn from our mistakes? In fact, successes are better in teaching us, you know, because you can replicate your success. If I was successful here, 
I can replicate it. So you can also uh, use the spirit of AI in doing your monitoring. And you are right, I suggest you monitor your plan like every three months or so, not to monitor it or to evaluate it only at the end of the year. Because people will be surprised. Even, even with employees, you know, it is good that you monitor them regularly rather than at the end, you just tell them, you know, you pay, get out of here. Okay? You might even have legal, legal uh, problems with regards to that because, you know, your lawyers, the lawyer of, of the other party will ask you, do you have any monitoring devices? How do you say this employee uh, should be terminated? What are your uh, measures? Di ba? Meron pa nga yung verbal feedback. Then, secondly, you have to write it down. And he has to sign it. Okay, only after several times can you dismiss the employee. Now, of course, that is in terms of in terms of legal legal cases. I suppose you don't do that with your catechists. <laughs> but uh, you can type that in the internet and you will find many resources. Any other? I, I left uh, another handout with uh, Sister Rhea. It's actually, oh, you have already reprinted it. It's actually an article that I wrote when I was still a student at Case Western Reserve University. I was asked to work with, I think, five or seven people to go to the Diocese of Cleveland in order to use appreciative inquiry. And I challenged myself and the rest of the group, how can we look at appreciative inquiry from a spiritual, uh, pastoral, and biblical perspective? The different phases. And uh, these are not entirely my ideas. I put them together, but I had a group, and I worked with them. Then at the end, they said, Greg, you can write down your name, and it's yours, because you wrote it. That is why this is published in a book. The title of the book is Lessons from the Field, Applying Appreciative Inquiry, edited by uh, two persons and published in 1998. Uh, this is already out of stock. They have not reprinted it anymore. Thank you. I have two copies in my library, but uh, the article that I wrote is entitled, A Spiritual Path to Organizational Renewal. And this was written in 1998. So if you follow this methodology, I suggest that in every step, before you do the step, you talk to your catechists or to whoever you are using this, you talk to them about the spiritual and scriptural perspective. And you have references here, how you have to see it in a spiritual way. In fact, uh, the article says that you can Use AI not only as a methodology, but as a way of life. You know, it can be a spirituality by looking at things from the perspective of grace. That God is practically and really in everything that we do. You know, even in planning the different steps. Even in planning the different steps. And don't fall into the temptation as sometimes when I did this planning, people objected. If you plan, you are working against the Holy Spirit. 
Let the Holy Spirit do whatever He wills. Don't plan. That is not true. In fact, I have some scripture passages here, one particularly from Luke, where it says if you plan to build the tower, or you want to build the tower, bless first plan if you have the resources to build it. Otherwise, don't start it because people will laugh at you. Or if you want to go to war with your number of troops, you have to think first, will you be able to rout the enemy or not? Otherwise, you go to them and offer peace. That is planning. And these are the words from the gospel. You have to plan. If we plan in our daily life, most of you here are family people. You know, you plan for your future. Why don't you plan for the church and for the faith? In fact, sa mga parokya natin, no? When I was teaching pastoral theology, I challenged my students to go to different parishes and to bring me the plans of the parish. And in many parishes, they encounter. You know, they ask the parish priest, Father, I don't put a pastoral plan in you. Well, I have a pastoral plan. Where is it, Father? Is it written? No, it's in here in my head. Tinabi ko, maniniwala ba kayo? Tinabi yun, hindi, walang pastoral plan yun. Because once you have written a plan, you know, more or less, you will follow it. Okay, so, meron na lahat ng copies. Read it during your free time. But I hope you, it will motivate you to use this methodology. Because, uh, the positive, the positive uh, uh, trust of the methodology is so much in line with our faith. You know, it gives us a lot of hope. In spite of the many problems that we encounter in taking care of our catechists, you have to realize that God is with you. You know, and you have to tell the catechists over and over again. This is the work of God. Opus Dei, the work of God, is not our own. You know? In fact, at the end of the day, I tell God, Lord, this is your work. Sinama mula ako rito, bakit sa akin dahil? Di ba? Dapat sa kanya yun eh. Sana nagtago na lang ako. But we cannot say that. Di ba? So, God, is working in them. And I just want to also acknowledge you because I know this is hard work. I would rather say mass than catechize. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And you ask many priests, they would say, I would rather ask, uh, say mass than hear confession. Well, that's why during Holy Week, I, I really hear confessions. Because they would say, I would rather say mass than hear confession. I don't know, because it may negative energy to me. So it drains you. And that is why our priests, even, we give them stipends, even, you know, just for coming and hearing confessions. Kahit na nakaupo sila half an hour, walang pumupunta rin, we still give them the stipend. Because, you know, sitting down there is no joke. You know, even if they are sleeping. <laughs> or saying the rosary. Oh, Father, here is your stipend for saying the rosary. You know? Yes, sister. <coughs> Question, Father, uh, would it be synonymous also that this appreciative inquiry to fraternal correction in a religious community? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> let me see. Fraternal correction is when you want to 
correct a particular person for deviating or doing something that is not uh, correct or that is not proper. However, you can also use appreciative inquiry and a positive, uh, positive way of correcting somebody. Okay, let me give you an example. When I was uh, first uh, vice president in Adamson in the year 2000, I was the vice president for student affairs. And at that time, uh, I, I had like two seminars on AI at the invitation of Dr. Rose Quentes, who is the dean of SIDI. Until now, she's still there. And so she invited me to give a seminar on AI because she heard that, you know, I, I took that and I knew what it is. So I agreed, but I told her, please come to Adamson so we can talk about the schedule, about your expectations, etc., etc. She said, yes. So we set a time. Now it happened that uh, she came at around 12 noon. She came at around 12 noon and she did not tell me. She just went to my office and nobody was there. My student assistants, the scholars, I had two was not there. My secretary was not there. And so uh, she asked the guard, where is Father Greg? And the guard in the front gate said, I don't even know who is Father Greg. <laughs> I was still in Adamson at that time. I was not even one year, so, you know, they didn't know. Now they were, he was looking, he was asking other guards, they didn't know where I was. You know, some of them knew who I was, but they didn't know where I was. It happened that at 12 noon, we have the mass in the <coughs> university chapel, and I was one of the concelebrants. I was the, the main celebrant. And I think one of the guards said, they looked, they peeped in the uh, chapel, and they did not see me, because I was seated down. I was at the main celebrant. In other words, Rose Puentes left, and then later on I received a text, Father Greg, I was there, and you did come. Where were you? you know? And because uh, I need to see somebody else, I left the university. So when I received the text, I went to my office, and I asked my secretary, saan ka ba nung lunch time? Okay. What about the other two? Father, we were also eating. So the office was closed. I said, didn't we talk about this? That there should always be one person in the office and that you take turns? He said, yes, Father. But, you know, I was stressed out. Because, you know, I missed that opportunity to meet with uh, Dr. Rose. And I told them, again, I repeat, I told them, this is something that we have to talk about. You have to be here, etc., etc. Okay, and they were quiet. And then I told them, I'm correcting you, etc., but I'm not saying you are not doing your jobs. You are doing them very well, and I'm appreciative of what you do. This is an isolated case, and I know it will not happen again. Yeah, that's what I told them. They said yes. Okay, then at the end of the day, uh, they all left. They all left. But the secretary stayed, and the secretary uh, told me something like, Father, talagang sinagun mo yung mga ano ah, yung mga student assistants dati. You know, sinabi ko, oo, sinabi ko kasi I was frustrated. Pero sinabi niya, but you know, uh, you have a way of saying it that did not insult them, that did not 
in India, they still felt appreciated despite the fact that they let you down, something like that, you know. And then I realized that, yes, you can use a positive affirmation even in correcting other people. In other words, you don't concentrate only on the mistake that they do, but you also acknowledge the many times. Okay? In fact, even my driver, I have a problem at home. And I told him, and we talked about it. We talked about this already, because sometimes I cannot find him. I said, come back. At the end, I always tell him, okay, this is something that happened today. I hope it doesn't happen again. But uh, three times that nangyari. <laughs> but still, you know, I keep on affirming him. I think one day it will get into his head. Okay. So, it doesn't mean to say that you cannot correct people because you are being positive. You can also correct them in a positive way. And they will, they will even accept it. They will even accept it. Because they, they are appreciated. And sometimes the remorse is even, is even deeper. Kasi alam nila, ano eh. Hindi ka babawi sa kanila, tatanggalin mo sila ng privilege, etc. So it is possible to do that. But you have to really uh, catch yourself. And sometimes I catch myself, you know, especially when I'm stressed out. That is why in the seminary, when I was a formator, and even in the university, I tell my secretary, you know, when I correct somebody, I always correct it inside my room. Then I close the door and I tell the secretary, don't bother me. Because that's where I find my tongue. Because, you know, I don't want other people to be affected. And when I'm already okay, then I open the door and say, who is there who wants to come next? Because kusunod sunod yun, yung negative energy goes on to the next one. And then you hear them telling the secretary, ano, may hindi pa ulo ni boss o hindi? <laughs> I, want, I don't want to hear that. So when you start hearing that, it means, you know, they can sense, they can sense if uh, you are frustrated. So you better close the door and uh, get your act together before you even talk to them so that they don't have negative energy. And really, when you are dealing with people, I remember uh, in the first uh, class that we had in organizational behavior, the professor said, you know, if organizations were made up of robots, this course that you have entered into is the most useless course in the whole universe. You are wasting your money. You better get out of here. But if organizations are made up of people, this is the most important course because here we will be teaching you how to deal with people. And really, when you are talking about people, you know, it's different. Every person is unique. So every person has to be 